Hey everyone, welcome back. We're continuing our reading of the wonderful book, which is a collection of lots of Native American lore. It's quite wonderful to learn about and read about, and I'm glad it survived. Some of the records, that is. So, we're on page 392. This is from the Haida tribe, and it's titled Origin of the Gnawing Beaver. The Haida of the Queen Charlotte Islands off the coast of British Columbia were great hunters of whales and sea otters. There was a great hunter among the people living at Larhuip on the Stikine River. So that's spelled L-A-R-H-W-I-Y-I-P. That's very interesting spelling. Stikine River. Ever on the alert for new territories, he would go away by himself for long periods and return with quantities of furs and food. He had remained single, although he was very wealthy and his family begged him to take a wife. As a true hunter, he observed all the fasts of cleanliness and kept away from women. So, apparently then, when a true hunter, he says, needs to be clean, keeps away from women. Interesting. One day, when he returned from a hunting trip, he said, I am going to take a wife now. After that, I will move to a distant region where I hear that wild animals are plentiful. So he married a woman from a neighboring village who, like himself, was very clever and scrupulous in observing the rules. When the time came for them to go on their hunting trips, they both kept the fasts of purification. So they kept the fasts, and the hunter got even more furs and food than he had before. Some time later, he said to his wife, Let's go to a new country where we'll have to stay a long time. After many days of traveling, they came to a strange land. The hunter put up a hut where they lived while he built a house. When he had finished it, he and his wife were happy. They would play with each other every other night. Soon he said to her, I'm going to my new hunting grounds for two days and a night. I will return just before the second night. In his new territory, he made snares in his trapline, and when these were set, he went home just before sunset on the second day. His wife was very happy, and again they played, and throughout all the night. After several days, he visited his snares and found them full of game. So he's having a lot of good luck so far. He's got a good relationship with his wife. His traps are catching food. He gets to go to a far distant land to hunt. This is interesting. He loaded his canoe and came back. Again before dark on the second day, very happy, he met his wife. And they both worked to prepare the furs and meat. So again here, a lot of uh, modern day woke vegans pretend that Native Americans didn't need meat and that they were just eating like rabbits all day. Clearly here, you can see that the relationship of hunters, you know, having furs and meats was something very integral to Native American society. When they had finished, he set out once more, saying, This time I intend to go in a new direction, so I'll be away for three sleeps. Be away for three sleeps. You know how some people measure like three moons or three risings? He said sleeps. And he did, and rejoiced in being with his wife again when he returned. To amuse himself when she was alone, the woman went down to the little stream flowing by the lodge. She spent most of her time bathing and swimming around in a small pool while her husband was away. It kind of sounds like what I would do in a way. Just add some books in there. As soon as he returned, she would play with him. Now he said, since you've become used to being alone, I'm going on a longer trip. Ooh, that sounds kind of mean. Gotten used to being alone. By then he had enlarged his hunting house. So enlarged his hunting house gotten bigger so he's gotten a good wife new territories he's keeping his fast he has money and now his house is enlarged he's having a lot of blessings and it was full of furs and food again it was sort of overabundance the woman again took to her swimming she soon found the little pool too small for her so she built a dam by piling up branches and mud the pool became a small lake deep enough for her to swim in at ease. Now she spent nearly all her time in the new lake and felt quite happy. When her husband returned, she showed him the dam she had made, and he was pleased. 
Before going away once more, he said, I'll be gone long time now that I know you're not afraid of being alone. Now that I know you're not afraid of being alone. So it seems like he keeps pushing the boundaries. So, I mean, being away for a longer and longer time. The woman built a little house of mud and branches in the center of the lake. After a swim, she would go in it and rest. At night, she would return to the hunting house on the land. But as soon as she walked in the morning, she would go down to the lake again. So they're both getting into their habits. She's going swimming. He's going hunting. He's going into the forest. She's going into the river. Forest, water. Eventually, she slept in her lake lodge all night. And when her husband came back, she felt uncomfortable staying with him at the house. Yeah, look at that. Their pattern changed. Before, they were always together. Now, he keeps leaving her. Now, she's getting too accustomed to not seeing him. Now, she was pregnant and kept more to herself. And she preferred to stay in the, her lake even when her husband was at home. To pass the time, she enlarged the lake by building the dam higher. She made another dam downstream. And then another, until she had a number of small lakes all connected to the large one which she had her lodge. Wow, she's busy too. The hunter went away on a last long journey. He had enough furs and food to make him very wealthy. And he planned that they would move back to his village after this trip. Okay, so to move back to the village after she's already established her little mini lake empire. I don't know how that'll go. The woman whose child was due any day stayed in the water all the time and lived all together in the lodge. By now it was pretty submerged. No, partly submerged. Oh, wow. And its entrance was underwater. Ooh, so the only way in was through under the water. Look at that. That's creative. When the hunt, which is exactly like kind of like what a beaver does, right? Get it? When the hunter returned this time, he could not find his wife. Oh. Yeah, in the video game Red Dead. The beavers, they're hard to find sometimes. They're by their little sticks. He looked all over, searching the woods day after day without discovering a trace of her. So now she spent so much time, she's made an entrance that you have to go underwater. And she's built so many, and they've been distant. Look at that. He was at a loss, unwilling to go back to his people without knowing her fate. For fear that her family might want to kill him. Well, they're probably like, hey, where's our daughter? Like, you guys were so happy. What happened? Plus, he was like this huge bachelor, so people are going to wonder. He returned sadly to his hunting house every night and each morning resumed the search. So now it's switched. He left her all by herself. And now he can't find her. Now he's spending time looking for her. One evening at dusk, he remembered that his wife had spent much of her time in the water. Perhaps she traveled on downstream. He thought the next day he walked down to the lake that his wife had dammed and went around it. But he saw nothing of her. He went around her because she's on the inside, right? After many days of searching, the hunter retraced his steps. When he came to the large lake, he sat down and began to sing a dirge. Now he knew that something had happened to his wife. She had been taken by a supernatural power. While he was singing and crying his dirge. Okay, so it's spelled D-I-R-G-E. must be some type of uh, solemn song, right? If it mentions it. A figure emerged from the lake. It was a strange animal. In its mouth, a stick, which was gnawing. On each side of the animal were two smaller ones, also gnawing on sticks. Uh-oh, what happened? Then the largest figure, which had wore a hat shaped like a gnaw stick. Well, that sounds like a cool hat to me. She spoke. Don't be so sad. It is I, your wife, and your two children. We have returned to our home in the water. Now that you have seen me, you will use me as a crest. Call me the woman beaver and the crest remnants of chewing stick. That's cool. So he sees her and is like, oh man, get disappointed. And now it's like, hey, we're your family. And she's going to go back into the water. And now that he's seen her, set a crest. So a crest is like an insignia. So that's very cool. It's like, now you've seen me. Now you're going to be this. Call me the woman beaver, the crest remnants of chewing stick. The children are first beaver, and you will refer to them in your dirge as the offspring of the woman beaver. After she had spoken, she disappeared into the waters, and the hunters saw her no more. At once he packed his goods, and when his canoe was filled, traveled down the river to his village. For a long while he did not speak to his people. Then he told them what had happened and said, I will take this as my personal crest. 
It shall be known as remnants of chewing stick and forever remain the property of our clan, the salmon eater household. This is the origin of the beaver crest and the remnants of chewing stick. Based on two versions of the same myth reported by William Bainon in 1949 and by Marius Berbu in 1953, the remnants of chewing stick and their clan is called the salmon eater household. That's pretty cool. The beaver crest. So that's how <laughs> the story was. So he had it all, man. And he, you know, could have kept his wife. But him doing that led to the, his crest appearing. It's quite a little whimsical story, isn't it? <laughs>